Hi, everyone. Thanks for calling in. This is Joe Simon with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Decathlon. We'll be getting started in about two minutes, so please hold for just a moment, and then we'll get started. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thanks everyone for taking the time to join our webinar today. My name is Joe Simon and I am with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Decathlon. We're excited today to be able to talk to you about many details of the upcoming BUILD Challenge. To begin, I'll first provide some uh, webinar details. Much like on a flight with safety information, some of this may be routine, but I hope you listen just the same. And if you zone out, come back in just a moment and we'll talk through more of the details of the build challenge. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. By doing so, we will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you choose the telephone option, a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin. If you would like to ask a question, please use the questions pane in GoToWebinar to ask your question. If you have difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, please note that today's webinar is being recorded and we will make both the recording and the PDF of the slides available on the Solo Decathlon website. And now for today's presentation. Our webinar today is Kickstart Your Solo Decathlon Build Challenge. Our speakers are Joe Simon with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and Linda Silverman with the Department of Energy. I'll turn it over now to Linda to talk about the history and excitement of the upcoming Solar Decathlon Build Challenge. Thanks, Joe. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're excited to tell you about um, the Solar Decathlon and more specifically today about the Build Challenge. If you can go back on one slide, to the what is the solar decathlon, or we can start here. Um, okay, so the solar decathlon, for, just to get everybody on the same page in case you missed yesterday's webinar that was really more about the design challenge, today we're gonna talk about the build challenge. But um, just to introduce, we um, the solar decathlon has now merged both the solar decathlon and the race to zero student design competition um, if you can go to one, the next slide, please. Um, so the uh, so race, uh, solar decathlon is now um, two competitions that have been merged. There you go. But it is still a collegiate competition where uh, we challenge student teams to design and build efficient and innovative buildings powered by renewable en energy across. 10 contests, 10 contests, hence the name Decathlon. This is a unique, exciting, inspiring, substantial, difficult, but rewarding project. And it's an amazing opportunity to prepare students for the workforce um, and to allow participating universities to gain notoriety because we get a lot of attention on this competition. And more than ever, it, it's really meeting student interest. Um, 
in transforming in transforming our energy system. Um, so they get to work on super energy efficient buildings um, and improve occupant health and comfort, saving dollars, reducing emissions, um, and engaging the home building industry and the energy industry. So it's really just a fantastic event. Next, okay, so stay on the slide that you're on. Okay, so um, the new solar decathlon, as I said, merges two competitions. The Race to Zero Student Design Competition is now called the Design Challenge. We're really not going to talk about that today. If um, you're interested in finding out more about that, uh, you can listen to the webinar or see the webinar slides um, that was held yesterday, and that will be on our website. Today we're going to talk about the Build Challenge. Um, and this is um, our new design really is responding to um, feedback and other things that we have heard about the um, Solar Decathlon. So we are responding to student, faculty, industry, and other feedback in our new redesign. So we have kind of taken the best of, um, of both competitions, thought of new things, and um, this is uh, our new approach. So in the Build Challenge, it's still a residential um, competition. The traditional Solar Decathlon is really what we're calling the National Showcase Division. Um, there is a new option, which is the local build, which we will talk about. But in any case, ev all teams are still competing against 10 contests. Next slide, please. Okay, so just a, a little bit more information. So the design challenge, as I mentioned, is the formal is um, what we formally refer to as the Race to Zero Student Design Competition, and it's where teams design a building over one to two semesters and present in, and they present um, their projects in April 2019. It's design only, um, and it is not a public event. For those teams that are interested um, in a longer term challenge, this is the build challenge. So as you can see, the National Showcase Division is really the traditional solar decathlon. And the idea there is to design and build and operate a functional, transportable house for display on the National Mall as part of the Folklife Festival 2020. We will talk more about that. There's also an option to do a local build. This is um, responding to a lot of feedback that we got. The um, local build, they will design and build a full-size house in a team's own community and then present and compete as part of the Folklife Festival 2020. So teams need to think about which challenge is the right one for them. And just a reminder that November 6th is the deadline. You can get more information, again, um, about the design challenge in, um, in yesterday's webinar, which is on our website. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so as everyone knows, um, the De decathlon is really about 10 contests. Teams um, must do well across all contests to win. Each of the 10 contests is worth 100 points for a maximum of 1,000 points. And teams are evaluated to determine how effectively they integrate energy efficiency into well-designed, high-performance buildings that push the envelope for consumers and industry. We want your houses to influence the energy transformation and in buildings. This year, um, there are really two new contests um, to the competition, resilience and financial feasibility and affordability. The other contests, um, the names may have changed a bit, but generally they're similar um, to what has happened in the past. In the design challenge, a single jury for each division will review all the competing teams. Um, because they, they have a single 25-minute presentation. Okay, so that's the last time I'm going to talk about the design challenge. In the build challenge, seven of the con contests that are on this page will be evaluated by juries, and three will be scored based on house performance 
and functionality. So what's interesting about this is that teens can choose what is the most important to them and their story and choose their target and, and then design accordingly. I like to say that the market potential is really the beginning of this, where teams really decide what their target market is, and then they design everything else around the other t uh, nine contests. Next slide, please. So just going back a little history for just to get everybody um, on the same page. Um, we um, last October, October 2017, we had our eighth event, um, U.S.-based event in Denver, Colorado. Um, Solar to Castleon tends to happen every two years, occasionally every three years, like this year. But basically, it's a biannual competition um, for teams to design, build, present, and compete um, with a single-family residential house. There have been more than 140 houses that have been built, and about almost 20,000 students have been involved. Um, the impact that we believe um, is career development, technology innovation, and public education through our um, showcase events. Um, it has really expanded to become an international movement, and there are now international solar decathlons in five regions, as you can see here. And I just returned recently from China for Solar Decathlon China, um, and I have to say it was amazing. It gets a lot of media attention, as you can see here. We um, over a billion uh, media impressions for a single event. Um, this is also DOE's largest public event, so DOE puts a lot of energy into this. Um, we don't tend to do that many public things. Um, we tend to speak to our industries, so this is a really awesome opportunity for us to show the public, um, you all, your, your students and your universities, and show them how inspiring you are and also educate them about the type of investments that DOE has been making for 40 years. I just wanted to uh, draw your attention to the photos um, on, the, on the right side. This is from Solar Decathlon 2002. The top is the village um, on the National Mall, and you can see in the background is the Capitol, and uh, below that is the winner of the first Solar Decathlon, which was the University of Colorado at Boulder. Next slide, please. So these are some fantastic um, photos that Joe put together, and it really shows the different phases of um, the Solar Decathlon events. Um, in some, there are, it shows the construction and assembly phase. Some are of the completed houses. On the top right, you can see um, our first snow at Solar Decathlon 2017. That was interesting. You can also, um, on the lower right, um, and in some other, and in, in the top, you can see the types of crowds that we get, um, especially on the National Mall. We can't emphasize enough the impact that this event has on visitors. People are really moved by um, seeing student designs, but by meeting the students, seeing which universities are involved. Um, we have groupies that return um, for each competition from around the world. So it's, it's a pretty awesome event. Okay, next slide. So what does it mean to compete? This is what you all really need to think about. First, you really want to think about your team's goals and passions. What matters to you? Are you driven by a certain target market because you're, um, you're, you have a particular challenge where your university is? Are you really interested in showing um, an innovation that you've come up with or that you want to come up with? Um, it's important to really think about that. It drives um, the energy of the team. You want to develop a complete application with your conceptual design um, because we will um, be down selecting um, following the November 6th deadline um, and we will announce uh, the top six teams in the national showcase and the top six teams in the local build um, in December. You want to design an at least net zero house that showcases the future. Um, note that the houses, 
power um, must generate enough um, solar energy to power the house and um, an electric vehicle. You want to recruit um, adequate team members who are committed to this. You want to look at your industry partners in your area or nationally, and you want to think about what sponsors you can get. You want to meet, um, build the house um, to meet all the codes and rules. And um, if you get into this competition, you'll hear about this a lot from uh, Joe Simon. You want to um, operate the house and really be mindful about how to earn points. That's a good thing to do. Um, you are going to present your solution to juries and to the public in Washington, D.C. It's great. Um, one thing that we really work on here is we're, we really pay attention to our website. Um, look at our history section. You can see the Flickr photos. Um, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter or go back and look at old Facebook and Twitter posts. And you can get a really good idea about um, how, to, how to compete and succeed in this competition. Next slide. So we've been asked along the way for advice for, um, for institutions that are thinking about being in the Solar Decathlon. And actually, just today, we put up a blog um, on our solardecathlon.gov site that has kind of um, advice and lessons learned um, for collegiate institutions, especially in educating um, your senior administrators um, in what it means to be in a solar decathlon. It's not a long document. It's just, um, it's a collection of advice that we've gotten from former teams and faculty and students. But um, it's very important to have your senior administrators um, and leadership uh, to be supportive. You also need good faculty and administrative support. Um, often a, a facilities office within a university will help with construction. Students, um, it's great to have as many students as you can and to have really com a committed, at least core group of students. Those that do best are those that think about fundraising right from the beginning and have a really good plan for that. And finally, it's good to think about where the houses will reside after the competition. Um, you can see here there is um, additional information. This is the site where the blog is. I just wanted to draw your attention here to the to the two photos. At the top is um, from is the University of Buffalo, uh, New York team from Solar Decathlon 2015. And below that is Team Capital DC from Solar Decathlon 2013. It's, the, it's a team-designed shading device, just to show you the types of things that the teams come up with. Next slide. OK, so why participate? What we've heard is this is the defining experience that students can have. Um, as part of their four-year experience or their graduate studies. Um, it really creates and develops critical career skills, both technical and soft skills that really make the difference in, um, in one's career. You get to learn from experts and peers. Um, we have challenge events. Both um, in April 2019, there will be a challenge event where we bring in world-class thought leaders but also obviously at the Folklife Festival event that will be um, in the summer of 2020. We'd like to showcase the future of construction. And we know that students are coming with so much ingenuity and so much creativity. Um, and this is really why DOE does this. We want to push the envelope. We know that students, um, by getting hands-on experience, they are getting unique training to prepare them for the clean energy workforce. We love that, and we intentionally have um, um, diverse contests so that teams must have an interdisciplinary team. It's a really big benefit um, that we hear from students because so often, even students um, are in their own departments and not necessarily interacting with others. And this is really a team event. 
And finally, you will become part of a huge network of past to athletes. And we actually have a closed LinkedIn um, uh, group of um, alums that um, we stay in contact with and allow alums to share information and really create a wonderful network. Next slide. So we really listened to feedback um, and we heard that uh, students and teams wanted to come back to the National Mall. And so we're so thrilled to announce um, our partnership with the Smithsonian Institution um, and that we will be a program of the Folklife Festival that takes place on an annual basis in D.C. over the two weekends surrounding July 4th. It's an annual event. I would say it's probably the largest um, uh, public event on an annual basis that we have in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Houses um, will be displayed on the mall, and um, the Folklife um, people tell us they expect anywhere from 400,000 to a million visitors, kind of depending on the year um, and, of course, the weather. You will get to showcase your house and you. The Folklife um, Festival is very interested in hearing, um, in allowing visitors to meet the students and hear from the students as part of the program elements that we'll have. The, um, the Smithsonian Folklife theme in 2020 um, is around resiliency for communities facing environmental impacts. So this will be a particularly um, interesting theme, and I know it's something that really resonates with a lot of students. So, um, okay, next slide, we'll tell you a little bit more about this. So as you saw on the last slide, um, there were a lot of people, um, and there, it also showed the types of events that are there. This slide also shows just various events. As you can see, the Folklife Festival takes place within um, viewing distance. It takes place basically between the Capitol and the Washington Monument. So you can see um, that on either side. There's all kinds of events that happen. Um, it, it, it has Interestingly, it has the same schedule that we've had in the past. It tends to be open either Wednesday or Thursday through Sunday um, of each week, um, which is also the way um, Solar Decathlon has always operated. Anyway, there's all kinds of things. There's food. There's market. Um, there tends to be tents where there's um, programs happening from like 11 a.m. Um, through the evening. So um, it's just, it's a lot of energy, gets a lot of foot traffic. It's a really fantastic event. I never miss it. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is just um, an example of how the Folklife Festival work. On the left is um, a schematic of the Folklife Festival from 2016, and it's the same area of the mall that we expect to be on. Um, if you can tell, there's a kind of green grass, and then there's sections around it that are um, kind of in uh, like a tan color, and that's where the houses will be. We'll show you a schematic of that. And on the right is an aerial view of the types of activities that take place in the gravel pathways and in the tree panels. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is just a conceptual drawing on the left side, but it's just to show um, the potential houses on the gravel pathway. Um, and the local build team exhibits would be in the tree panels. We're still working at that out with um, the, uh, the Smithsonian, but um, that's the type of thing we're looking at. On the right side, um, in 2011, following our competition, or I think it was either prior to or after our competition, um, the Tennessee team also displayed their house at the Folklife Festival. And note the rented ramps um, that were put up for access to that. They actually intentionally designed their house to be on a transportable trailer. Um, and that's something that we're hoping teams will do this year. Next slide, please. So 
we're also excited to expand Solar Decathlon to a very large industry event. One of the items of feedback we got is that there's not enough home building industry, like conventional home building industry um, attendance at Solar Decathlons. And so we've been working with the National Association of Home Builders um, to come up with, um, with a way that these houses can be displayed at their international builder show. It's a very, very gigantic conference. Um, so this um, opportunity will happen after um, the Solar Decathlon competition finalists have been announced in the summer of 2020. This will be in IBS 2021, which will be, as you can see, in February in Orlando, Florida. And it's, um, we will have more details to come. We're still working it out with NAHB. Um, but on the, on the lower right side, you can see that Solar Decathlon has been part of IBS in the past. They brought scale models and um, got to interact um, with um, attendees to that conference. But this is kind of the size of the conference. In the middle is the outdoor section of IBS where they have other house styles. Nothing will come close to yours. Um, and on the left side is kind of the inside area. It's a very crowded, large, very impressive event. Next slide, please. So um, we really thought also about expanding the outreach that Solar Decathlon has. We in the past have tended to focus on the event site and um, the venue that we have for Solar Decathlon. So in creating a local build option, we are taking advantage of that and requiring all um, teams, whether they're in the national showcase or the local build, to present um, in their local communities their houses, to open their houses for a couple of weekends um, in the May-June timeframe in 2020 so that we can ex expand the number of visitors that are visiting both in your local community and then also, obviously, there will be a lot of people that can attend um, in on the mall in the, um, in the summer of 2021. In addition, um, team, we will have groups of team uh, students and faculty from each team that will attend the Design Challenge Weekend, which as you can see here is April 12th to the 14th, 2019. Teams will present their designs to a single jury who will then um, give them the approval to proceed. There's also, um, it's very important to create an online and active media presence. This helps teams not only bring people to your events, but also to bring people to our events and also helps with um, getting a buzz to attract sponsors. And of course, you will be competing with hundreds of students at the Build Challenge events. And we find that the students absolutely love meeting other students that have been working on um, their houses and seeing how they grapple with the challenges of the 10 contests and the 130 pages of rules, et cetera. So let me just uh, share with you some of the photos in this slide. On the left side at the bottom is the University of Maryland 2011 team. It's installed permanently on the uh, PEPCO campus. This is our local utility in the Washington, D.C. area. And they continue to host uh, visitors, and, it's, and it really provides for ongoing re outreach and testing. The middle two photos um, is from the Parsons School of Design and Stevens Institute of Technology 2011 team which was built in partnership with the Habitat for Humanity. And it has um, it was built as a single-story house, but it has ultimately become a two-story duplex installed in Washington, D.C. And on the right um, is an Ohio State House from um, Solar Decathlon 2011, which is uh, was installed at the Columbus Zoo um, for, per, uh, for tours on a permanent basis. 
note also that if you're interested in seeing um, a lot of where the houses ended up, we uh, also put a lot of attention on this. If you go to the solardecathlon.gov website and you look at the top, um, there's a history tab and you can go to um, any of the team, um, any of the prior solar decathlons. There's all kinds of information about the teams, but also where are the houses now. Next slide, please. So um, this is, we were, again, very responsive to feedback. We really, really listened. That's probably why we took a little longer to get our competition guide out. But um, we really tried to integrate two competitions with shared common objectives. We are really paying attention um, to increasing cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness both for the teams and for DOE. We wanted to increase opportunities for collegiate institutions to engage um, and collaborate both um, among each other and also with in their local communities. We wanted to reduce costs and logistical burdens on collegiate institutions. It's a message that we heard over and over. I've uh, mentioned the increase in um, an opportunity for public engagement and we continue to be open to international participation. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see some um, photos at the bottom of this slide showing various ways that students have been involved. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say. Next slide. So I'm gonna pass the baton to Joe Simon, our amazing competition manager. You will come to know him very well and learned so much from him. He is a former decathlete and team manager, so there is really no one better to guide the teams. So with that, I will pass the baton to Joe and take a drink of water. Thanks. Thanks so much, Linda. As mentioned, I'm very excited and passionate about the Solar Decathlon and all of the different ways that universities universities can participate, both through the design challenge and through the build challenge, particularly this year where we have different ways to participate in the build challenge as well. So in the next 30 to 45 minutes or so, I'm going to talk through the challenge requirements, provide several past examples that I think can serve as inspiration for how you may choose to design a home either as part of the local build challenge or as part of the national showcase challenge. I'm going to provide some recommendations for success, both through your application process, how to structure a team, how to participate, and then provide an opportunity at the end to our questions and answers. So first, I wanna point everyone's attention to the solidecathlon.gov website, where you can access the Solar Decathlon competition guide. This is the Bible of the event. It's a very intense document with a great deal of information that talks through all the different aspects from student eligibility to participate, how we score measured contests, how juries will evaluate your submissions, what those submissions are, how the different documents work, how the divisions work, a summary of important dates, all of the information that we're presenting you to you today in this presentation, in this webinar is pulled from that competition guide. Those successful teams are those that read that guide. So I encourage you to go there, read it, ask questions, and continue to use it through your entire participation. You can, again, just go to solodecathlon.gov. As Linda mentioned, we do have both a national showcase and a local build team in which teams can either build a transportable house that they can use uh, to present their designs both in their own communities as well as in their own uh, national showcase divisions, but they can also participate through the local build challenge where they build a house permanently in their own communities. That could be in your own city, it could be in a neighboring community, it could be in the region, but you find a partner, you find a site, you find a reason for uh, having that construction. That isn't to say that the national showcase teams don't also have a permanent installation. They often and nearly always do, uh, but they also can be shown on this different sort of tourable model. And so we see uh, construction progress 
and the build house documented prior to arrival on the competition site that all teams will offer tours in their own communities, all teams will compete and exhibit in Washington, D.C., all jury presentations will be in Washington, D.C., and we will announce our winners together at the Folklife Festival. So this is a single challenge in which you have different divisions where you can choose to participate. To provide a bit more detail, in the National Showcase Division, we're limiting the size to be up to 15 feet wide, 14 feet tall while in transportation mode, and 60 feet long. The reasons for these constraints tie both to the ability to ship the house along roadways, which often have width, height, and length re restrictions, as well as the restrictions of the National Mall, where when we need to park on the gravel pathways, as Linda has mentioned, we need to make sure that there's still walking space for the visitors on either side of the houses, and we also have space for the ramps, as Linda mentioned, to be providing accessible tour routes into and through each house. Uh, you will be able to see throughout this presentation, both on this image as well as on other slides, some examples of houses from the past that are close to compliant with the 2020 rules. So you'll see on the top, the Tennessee team, how they had the interior studio space. You'll see on the lower left, the Illinois team that shipped as a complete module on a single truck. And you'll see the University of, uh, or Rice University on the bottom right from 2009 as a low-income housing solution as well. We see from the National Showcase Division, teams targeting target markets that could include urban infill, such as accessory dwelling units or multifamily housing. We see solutions such as disaster resiliency or disaster response, or even rural solutions where the local workforce doesn't have the capability to build the high performance solutions that your university is considering. We do expect them to be a minimum of 400 square feet of conditioned space, to have separate entry and exit doors, and to be easily transportable and assembled on the competition site. In the local build division, we have more flexibility for what the houses may be. We say that they may be between 600 and 3,000 square feet, and that they could be everything from single family, low income housing, it could be a townhouse, it could be a retrofit. Um, teams have a lot of opportunity. It could still be modular construction. Teams have opportunities to think about what they want to present, how they respond to a local need, and how they maximize their resources to impact the construction, the built environment, the innovations, and the ideas without having to think about transportation or other movements. We do ask those teams to think about bringing a compelling exhibit to Washington, D.C. to exist in those tree panels, as Linda had mentioned, that can show off some of those innovations. So maybe it's a mechanical system, maybe it's your solar system, maybe it's virtual reality or augmented reality, maybe it's wall sections or scale models, but bring something that you can use to talk about your ideas and your design to the university students. Do note that you can have a multiple story house. You, the entire house does not need to be handicap accessible, but you do need to make sure that you do have an accessible tour route through your house. Even if at the end of the day, after the competition has ended, the ramp goes away and you have stairs into that house, you need to have an accessible tour route through that house. It could just be the first floor, not to the second floor, but you do need to think about that process. So what I'm going to do now is walk through the structure of the Solar Decathlon Competition Guide and the Build Challenge Rules so that you have a better understanding of how your participation in the competition would be structured, the activities you would need to complete, what the contests look like, how the juries and the officials would evaluate your performance, and the deliverables that you'll need to submit along the way. In terms of the important dates, please note that, as Linda mentioned, the applications are due on November 6th, 2018. This is a very hard deadline, and at that point, we as the organizers will review all the applications we've received, and in the build challenge, we will down select to six teams in the local build challenge and six teams in the national showcase division. In, across these two divisions, we expect 12 teams in total, and this is due uh, both to make sure that we have a high quality targeted number of teams and to fit within the constraints of our industry and folk life partners. So we will let teams know 
who is selected by December of 2018, at which point we really encourage teams to hit the ground running. You can work all this fall semester because we also recognize that we want teams to continue their participation. If you aren't selected as one of the competing teams in the build challenge, you will be invited to continue your participation as part of the design challenge, and you can continue your design throughout the spring semester. In February, we'll get your first deliverable, which will be a project management plan. In March, we'll get your design development drawings, showing your general idea for your design, your mechanical systems, your approach to site and other areas. In April, you'll submit a design presentation, which we'll then use between April 12th and 14th on the National Renewable Energy Laboratory campus in Golden, Colorado, where we'll have 60 teams present and sharing their ideas, the 12 from the Build Challenge and 48 from the Design Challenge. In November, we will receive your construction documentation. So at this point, as of November of 2019, you should really know what you're going to build. Some teams may have already started construction. It's okay to be in advance of this timeline, but you can't be behind. We need to know that you know how to build a code compliant and rules compliant house as of November 5th. In February, we'll get any updates or corrections to those drawings. You should be under construction at this point. You'll be building your house you know, from December, January, February, March, April. You'll be building and testing your house. In March, we'll get a project summary that we'll use for public outreach. In uh, May, we'll get your jury documentation that the juries will review. In May and June of 2020, we'll encourage the houses to be open in their own communities for tours, both the local build and the national showcase teams. And then between June 25th and July 5th in 2020, we'll be open to the public on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. So to recap what we've talked about in abstract before, your very first thing that you should do is you should read the rules, read the competition guide. You have a good understanding of what you need to do, how to do it, and how teams have done this in the past. You should review those past entries. The Solar Decathlon website, as well as the historical Race to Zero website, provide a great deal of past examples from construction drawings to jury presentations to project manuals of all of the past entries. We have great photography. You have all the details you need to really say what worked, what didn't, how can we improve on the ideas of the past. You'll then submit an application again by November 6th in which we'll be able to review all of the teams that are interested in participating and choose the 12 that best represent the ideas and innovation and resources necessary to build the houses. Throughout this process, we'll use groups.io to share information in a consistent way. We do this to make sure that even if you have team members join the project later, they can always access all of the communications that the organizers have ever provided, as well as the relevant uh, files. We'll have some building science training. We encourage you to find industry partners. We'll ask you to attend webinars and monthly calls, and then you'll design and document your project. You'll submit deliverables. Ultimately, you'll build a house. You'll exhibit that house compete and win. And when I say win, I mean everyone. By participating, by building, by learning, by doing, every single team that participates wins. I've had teams who came in absolutely last place in the Solar Decathlon in the past speak about the project years later, speak about how it changed their community, how it changed their university, how they were able to compete at a level that they never thought was possible through the Solar Decathlon. They learned through that process and where they ranked in the end didn't matter. Their success in their participation was the win. So ultimately, you'll need a team to help reach success. We'll need faculty advisors. Some teams have one really dedicated faculty advisor who is committed throughout the two-year process to ensure the university's success and commitment from leadership. Uh, some have multiple faculty advisors with other levels of engagement. It really is up to your university, how you structure it across disciplines, how you structure it across departments. You should have team leaders, people who are really responsible for delivering success. It could be an overall project manager, a, someone who is responsible for the safety and operations of your team members, a construction manager, someone who leads the architecture team or the engineering team, but there are team leaders who take responsibility for these individual aspects. It's important to think about the multi multidisciplinary participation so that we have people who are not just engineers, 
not just architects, but it's across the university, across your community to get the best possible solution and that you reach out to your community, work with the local firms, work with the local construction agencies, work with the local industry organizations so that you can have the best possible resources and the best possible ideas of the house that you're building. In the Solar Decathlon, there are 10 contests, as we've talked about. In the Build Challenge, seven of these contests are evaluated by juries, and three of these contests are evaluated by measuring the performance or the functionality of your as-built house. In engineering, architecture, market potential, and resilience, the juries will evaluate your house against a set number of criteria, as well as note the innovation of your team associated with their particular topic of consideration. Their scores will then feed into the innovation jury, which will sum up the four other juries' understanding of innovation separate from overall smart design and smart performance. We also look at your financial feasibility and affordability and your presentation. In the, three juried, in the three measured contests, we check your energy performance, your operations and comfort and environmental quality. We'll talk through each of these contests with some detail. In energy performance, the contest evaluates the building's energy use and production, as well as its capability to provide energy services, whether connected to the electricity grid or operating on site or with stored power. Do note that for both the local build and the national showcase teams, your houses are required and expected to be able to operate islanded or off grid. This enables all the houses to be able to perform in the contest criteria while also not being dependent on local utilities for providing interconnection agreements, as well as recognizing that we won't have a two way power flow of energy on the National Mall in Washington, DC. So we'll check the energy efficiency of the house by evaluating each house and scoring them with a HERS score. We'll verify the ability to create power through photovoltaics through energy production. We'll do an energy analysis to understand your overall performance of your house. We'll make sure that the house can do some demand response. It can respond to a utility call for load, uh, load shedding, and we will check your off-grid functionality for some critical loads. In engineering, this contest evaluates the effective integration of high-performance engineering solutions in energy-efficient and energy-producing buildings. On the right, you'll see all of the criteria that the jury will consider and provide feedback on, and so I encourage you to read the guide to consider all of these criteria in detail as you think about the optimal design that you want to create. In architecture, a set of jurors will evaluate the building architectural design for its creativity, overall integration of systems, and ability to deliver outstanding aesthetics and functionality along with energy efficient performance. As with engineering, you'll see all of the criteria that are being considered extracted from our competition guide. So I encourage you to read all of that information. In market potential, this contest evaluates the building's responsiveness to its stated target market, likely appeal to intended occupants and construction industry and the ability to transform how energy is used in buildings given its approach and wide scale desirability. And so the idea behind this is that each team should choose a target market. It's basically like calling a pool shot and then the jury will evaluate how successful you were in creating a design that responds to that target market. At that same scale though, from a market potential point of view, we also want to understand that the ideas and the innovations contained within your house could also relate to the US building industry. And so if you have a new type of wall system, a new type of mechanical system, a new approach to energy storage or energy services, and how that could be impacted across different target markets, that's also important. So we need to think about those different areas as we go through this process. In terms of financial feasibility and affordability, this contest evaluates the building's financial costs and the ability to address growing affordability challenges in the housing industry. Do note, however, that we do not have a strict dollar limit or an affordability definition for which all buildings must stay within. You have to think about who your target market is and whether or not you made smart and appropriate decisions on your, the design and implementation of your house to demonstrate that it is financially feasibility for the intended occupant or owner and that it is affordable not just with first costs, but also with operations costs over the life of the building. 
and Resilience, which is a new contest for 2020. This contest evaluates the building's ability to withstand and recover from prevailing disaster risks for its intended location, maintain critical operations, and ensure long-term durability. And so what we're looking at here is that the jury should understand the design decisions that you took in your house to make sure that the house remains at its peak operating performance for a long period of time into the future, both during disasters and after disasters and responding to those disasters. So it's about water infiltration. It's about finishes of your buildings. It's about islanding capability. It's about control and communication capabilities. So you can think about all the different ways in which your building can be resilient, not just during a disaster, but for the long term as well. In the operations contest, we're testing how effectively and efficiently the building operates to carry out intended functions while ensuring performance persistence. And so in this, we're going to test your kitchen appliances. We're going to ensure your hot water system is efficient and functional. We're going to make sure that you have the ability to wash clothes. We're going to make sure that your electric lighting is sufficiently bright to, perform, uh, to provide functionality to the occupants that you have considered home electronics and smart home electronics in your design and that it is functional, that you're able to operate your house safely with good CO2 levels and other aspects uh, with multiple people having a good time in your house and that you have the capability to charge an electric vehicle uh, within the design of your house overall. In comfort and environmental quality, we're going to make sure that the building's capability to integrate comfort and indoor environmental quality with energy efficient performance and so we need to make sure that your house does function, that it can reach a comfortable temperature, that it can maintain a comfortable humidity and a healthy humidity, that there is good indoor air quality in terms of CO2 control, that you have built an airtight house, and that you have considered noise infiltration and internally generated noises as part of your design. It's important to note for any returning teams that for this edition of the Solar Decathlon, we are evaluating the functionality of your house much more closely than we are evaluating the performance of tasks over time. So in the past, we may have said, we need you to wash and dry towels six times during the contest week, or you need to keep the lights on for these specific hours. In this 2020 edition, we're closer to evaluating, can your house do this thing? Can it reach the appropriate temperature? Can it maintain indoor air quality? And less about the task completion over the passing of time and multiple days. In the innovation contest, we evaluate the design success for incorporating innovations or creative approaches that enhance energy efficiency, energy production, grid interconnection, interaction, and building operations. In innovation, it shouldn't just be innovation for innovation's sake or new for its own sake, but it needs to be functional and add value. So we ask the four juries from engineering, resilience, architecture, and market appeal to consider how innovative you were in their approach and their subject matter expertise. We also ask them to consider whether or not the innovation is safe, whether or not it will maintain, whether or not it can be operated effectively by the homeowners if it's functional. And so look at all of the cri contest criteria to understand the innovation contest. We do wanna point out that innovation comes in all shapes and forms. It can be an innovative way of combining market-ready technologies to showcase the most reliable, cost-effective, and energy-efficient performance possible, or it could also be inventing an entirely new technology or using your own university's research and development capabilities to create that process. And so innovation does not just have to be research and development, and it doesn't have to be just taking market-ready technologies. It really is up to your team and what excites you overall. In presentation, this contest evaluates the team's ability to accurately and effectively convey its design and energy performance strategy to relevant audiences. An important part of the Solar Decathlon Build Challenge is presenting your solution to the public. It's presenting your solution to juries, both uh, present and from afar. So what did you do from a website or social media point of view? How did you deal with good quality documentation or drawings or renderings or photography? How did you present your design on the competition site on the National Mall? All of these different areas will tie into the overall calculation of your score for the presentation jury. Overall, how do we come up with the scores for your team? In the Solid Cap Phone, there are 10 contests. Each of them are worth 100 points. The team with the most points at the end of the competition wins. And so for 
the build challenge, how do we get to those 100 points or fraction thereof? For each of the juried contests, we have three to five jurors, and the jury will review both divisions, but will score and rank each division separately. A jury's evaluation consists of deliverable review, extensive evaluation of the as-built house. For the national showcase teams, this will be walking through the actual house that's present on the National Mall. For the local build teams, this will be evaluating the professional architectural photography. It'll be evaluating video walkthroughs. And as we'll see later in this presentation, some modern technologies for documenting the houses as you actually build them. And then ultimately, by combining the evaluation of the as-built house, the presentations by the teams, and the deliverables review, there'll be deliberation and scoring from zero to 100 for each of those juried contests and each of the participating teams. In the measured contest, we're going to be evaluating the functionality and verification of organizer-provided equipment within the team house. And so was the team able to keep the lights on at a sufficient level? Were you able to meet the appropriate temperature and humidity? What was the HERS score of your house? Staff will visit each local build team and staff will be present on the National Mall for the National Showcase teams. And we will provide the measured results as part of the scoring process. You can see here an example of how we sum up all of the scores as part of the Solar Decathlon build challenge. So you can see for example, uh, the winning team in the Swiss team did well across multiple contests. They did very well in architecture. They did less well in market potential. They did very well in engineering, and they did less well in innovation. But overall, their team earned the most points and won the competition. You can see how these different areas tie together in terms of the collection of measurements and the collection of juried contest results. Do note that the contests have changed for the current edition of the Solar Decathlon. Review the competition guide for current details. With that said, that's a lot of detail about how to participate successfully in the competition. I would like you to leave inspired and think creatively about how you can participate in this build challenge for the future. And so I'm going to provide some examples from the past purely for inspiration. None of these are supposed to be better than any other ideas from the past that may or may not have won. And not all of these are necessarily entirely compliant with the rules as, as written, but I hope that it will get, help you to think creatively about the different types of designs that may be possible in Solar Decathlon 2020. First, we'll talk through the National Showcase compliant homes. Then I'll give some examples of local build compliant homes. We'll talk through some examples of what exhibits could be for the local build teams on the National Mall. And then we'll give some examples of how we think we can represent your house on a worldwide scale, regardless of whether or not people can visit the house in person. We'll talk through a few target market examples and some team structures. On the right of this slide, on the top, you can see a solution of a single module design that was able to be transported on a truck and it is able to incorporate clear story windows, the solar panels, a small courtyard. We wouldn't have the stairs for Solar Decathlon 2020. We would have a ramp instead, but you get the general idea of how a single module solution could be appropriate for different types of audiences. You'll also see from a different design aesthetic on the bottom, the Virginia Tech team from 2009, uh, who built a design that was transportable enough that in addition to participating at Solar Decathlon, they brought their house to the Times Square in New York City, and it was featured on the Today Show. So they were able to have some ramps added. They were able to set the doors in place, tilt their solar panels up, and they were otherwise ready to go. They're able to show off their idea on a very national scale. This same house was then able to participate in Solar Decathlon Europe and traveled overseas in a very transportable and modular fashion. So you can see different approaches to that modularity. On this slide, this is a low income housing solution that is also generally compliant with the National Showcase Division. You can see a single module solution from Rice University, their zero house, that incorporates a light corridor that has a bedroom, a bathroom, a mechanical room, a kitchen, a dining room, and a living room, all within a single transportable module. You'll also see that it was permanently installed in a low-income housing community in the university's own community after the event. 
So for compliance here, we wouldn't have the deck coming out the side and we would have temporary ramps instead of the stairs. But you can see how can, it can easily be transported under bridges, uh, down the road and all these different areas. Here you can see the second place entry from the University of Illinois in Solo Decathlon 2009. It is a mostly compliant solution with National Showcase. You'll see how they added a sort of triangle roof cap to the top of the ship module on the bottom left. We'd look for a more compliant shipping module for Solar Decathlon 2020, but you can see the volume that's possible in the space in the top left image, where you can see from the floor plan, a nice living room, a full-size dining room, an extensive kitchen with a circulation space, a bathroom, a mechanical space, as well as a separate bedroom. You can also see from the graphic above how the house was able to be transported underneath bridges down the road to get to the competition site. In this example from Tennessee, as Linda talked about earlier, you'll see how the team, because of their integrated trailer design, was able to bring their house to the Folklife Festival. They were able to bring it to the statewide uh, annual fair, the state fair. They were able to bring it to other city or university activities such as a football game and able to show off their innovation to a large number of attendees in different areas. You're able to see here that instead of the one bedroom approach that we saw in Rice and the University of Illinois, they took more of a studio approach with two bathrooms, a mechanical space, the kitchen, living, and other sleeping areas. So you can see different approaches to the construction that still allow for a wide range of compliant designs. I'd also like to point out that this type of scale of housing solution is not unique to the solar decathlon, but we see a great deal of industry professionals thinking really hard and investing millions of dollars into these types of transportable, efficient housing solutions to help solve national and other industry crises for affordability or rapid installation with high quality construction. On the left, you'll see Casita. And so it's a startup out of Texas that is considering both standalone modules that can be installed as cabins or as accessory dwelling units or as small housing solutions, as well as multifamily solutions uh, that are all transportable and put together. New to Solar Decathlon Build the Challenge 2020 is the opportunity for you to create a multifamily design and a multifamily solution as part of the National Showcase Division. So you can show how that single module, which is still a complete dwelling unit, could be installed in multiple places in a stacked solution or a side-by-side -side type solution. On the right, you'll see Blockable. This is another startup that is similarly considering a expanded and different flexible modular housing approach that could consider studio space, it could be working space, it could be different types of housing space for how that could be installed. There's other companies as well that are working on things like this. It could be Blue Homes, it could be other uh, modular housing manufacturers across the country, but there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of high quality architecture, engineering, venture capital, and other investors thinking about this scale of housing. And so we think that the opportunity in the National Showcase Division is to innovate and to engage with this industry and change the world for the better. In addition to that, however, we also recognize that the housing of the United States and the world is not only 350 to 600 or 700 square foot solutions, but it's often larger than that. So how do we create solutions that are really impactful and permanent on their own communities without having to spend time and resources on transportation and shipping? And so there's some examples here of solar decathlon teams that have been successful in the past. This Parsons Stevens team, as Linda mentioned, has been installed permanently in the Linwood neighborhood of Washington, D.C. as a duplex. And so you can see how the team planned an accessible tour route through one side of that duplex on one story, even though ultimately there are stairs to a second floor, there's an additional bedroom, there's an additional unit, they're able to split that difference of being able to build something that's appropriate for their industry partner who needs a duplex solution while also showing how you can build passive house standards in a Habitat for Humanity type of building environment at a cost structure that works at that type of environment. So it's a really unique way to consider that type of partnership. You can also see here a success story coming out of the Race to Zero, which is now the design challenge to ultimately build a larger scale house through partnership with industry, through partnership with the university. And so Penn State's 
student team's award-winning submission to the 2015 Race to Zero competition, worked with the Green Build community to build a duplex and actually instigate those ideas that were developed as part of participation in that competition. So you can do similar things in that type of construction. We also see a lot of opportunity for pairing or modeling off of some successful design build programs at u universities across the country. So on the top left, you'll see Rural Studio, one of their built houses. In the top middle, you'll see Yale University, a house that they built permanently. In the top right, Utah Design Build Bluff. Bottom left was University of Colorado. And on the bottom right was Tidewater, Virginia. So think differently about what might be possible for integrating and demonstrating cost-effective, financially feasible, zero energy housing solutions within the Solar Decathlon competition while still having the national framework for being able to present your ideas to a national and international stage. As we mentioned, we know that if these houses are built locally, there are some great ideas and great ways to engage people beyond the posters, beyond a static slideshow or static video to engage people to learn about the innovations and the ideas that your team is developing. So on the left, you'll see that the winning team from Solar Decathlon 2017, the Swiss team had developed what they called a fully productive envelope. So it was their own type of framing system, their own foldable uh, solar panels and solar thermal and planting systems that they wanted to showcase how you could have an entirely productive envelope. Instead of shipping their entire house to the United States, they could consider bringing an example of their productive envelope and demonstrating that to the public. On the top, you may see some mechanical systems that are uniquely developed by those students. Maybe that portion is transportable and you can showcase to the public on the National Mall and potentially at the International Builder Show, how your university innovations could really function in a professional environment. On the bottom, right below that, you'll see a 10 foot by 10 foot mock-up that the University of Tennessee had built and brought along to different events before they built their whole house. Could you bring that to show off your solar panels, to show off your shading systems, your wall systems, your framing systems, all these different areas in a way that costs much less than shipping that entire house? You could do scale models. You can see on the bottom here, the Washington University St. Louis team developed a new type of concrete wall system in partnership with industry. They could bring examples of that wall system to demonstrate that to the public. You also see solar panels or framing systems that those teams could exhibit. You may be able to bring a functional wall section, so a full-size wall section that shows how insulation is different, that shows how SIPs work, that show these different areas. On the bottom in the middle, the Appalachian State team had smaller pieces that were able to be pulled by a standard pickup truck that the university already owned. And so that could be transported to Washington, D.C. at a much more cost-effective price point to show off both the permanent construction in your local community as well as the ideas and innovations to the hundreds of thousands of visitors to the Folklife Festival. On the bottom right, you'll see the core that Stanford University had developed and built as part of their 2013 entry. Their idea was that you could have a easily shippable core that included a fully functional kitchen, a fully functional bathroom, and all your mechanical systems such that local builders could just build two, three, four bedrooms surrounding that core, a big living room or a small living room, whatever is appropriate for the environment, as long as that functional core was built first. On the top right is something to think about as well. So Clemson University had developed their own type of wall framing system, which you can think of kind of like a 3D jigsaw puzzle. And so teams can actually uh, put together these different pieces without skilled labor, without power tools. Could they, over the course of their exhibit on the National Mall, continually and routinely and repeatedly work with the visitors to build a small section, take it apart, build it again over and over to show off their idea and how it could really change the market. We also recognize that the industry and the world has changed to really have great opportunities for digital house representation and ideas, both from high quality professional architectural photography through video walkthroughs, through 360 degree views or unique uh, photography from annotated or active or engaging floor plans to augmented reality or virtual reality opportunities as well. We also like to pursue opportunities 
such as this, which is called Matterport. It's a uh, device which captures an entire environment in 3D using a combination of photography and lasers, where you can then walk throughout that house and really understand its performance. You can click all these circles and see the house under construction. You can see the framing. You can see a dollhouse view. And I encourage you to sort of search and look around for Matterports to see some examples of how you can document your house so that people, either for, through virtual reality, on their phones, or through their computers, can understand your house performance in a really immersive way. Ultimately, through both the Local Build Challenge as well as the National Showcase Challenge, we believe that there are target markets for everyone. There's urban infill, there's accessory dwelling units. You can impact production housing. You could impact low-income housing. It could be aging in place. You could focus on disabled occupants. You could focus on rural housing. As we mentioned, there's a new opportunity to focus on multifamily solutions. It could be disaster relief. It could be disaster resiliency. You can do a retrofit or a redesign of an existing home. It could be remote worker housing. It could be for indigenous populations or even temporary housing. The opportunities are endless as long as you think about housing, energy efficiency, and high quality performance across your different types of solutions. We also encourage multidisciplinary teaming. When I was a student team leader, I always used to say that there is something for everyone in the soul of Decathlon. It's not just architecture and engineering as you may think, but there are roles for health and human services where someone may think about the indoor environment or aging in place. Are there fall sensors? Are there ways to monitor people's heart rates or their health conditions or whether or not they're taking their medicine? Are there ways to work with communications majors or business majors to really tell your story in the best possible way? How can you work with environmental or sustainability uh, majors to think about the overall impact of your solution and how this might work? How can industrial design or in interior design help build unique interiors and build unique furniture, build unique systems for operating on the, under a smaller environment. I really encourage you to think about multidisciplinary teaming as part of your overall compliance solution, as well as working with industry partners. And so this can be working with builders or architects. It can be working with your own city officials. It can be finding contractors who help with some of the construction or developers who have a particular problem. It could be those energy auditors who can tell you what good design is, how your house will perform. It can be connecting with those professionals, those engineers, or those tradespeople, or any of your alumni for success in the program overall. Ultimately, to succeed, as I've mentioned several times, I encourage you to read the Solar Decathlon Competition Guide. Plan for good team communication. Make sure you secure commitments from your university leadership, because this is a big undertaking. Make sure you submit your deliverables on time. You develop your industry partnerships. You create an interesting and finished product, and you explain that project well. Just because it's good, if you can't explain it, people won't know that it's good. And ultimately, make sure you read that guide and what you do is compliant with all of the rules. So now, very briefly, to talk you through our Build Challenge application process and selection process. As we've mentioned earlier, teams must apply by November 6th. You have to indicate whether or not you would like to participate in the local build or the national showcase division. You have to pay a $100 non-refundable application fee. This is to help cover some costs of the event, such as food or uniforms or other areas, as well as ensure that the applications we get have had some type of real commitment. It's a, not a giant dollar amount, but just the fact that the dollar exists help makes things real. Money talks the way of the world. Uh, we also make sure that you submit a build challenge proposal. And so this is something that talks about your team structure, your conceptual design, and your approach to your solution. From that, we will quickly review all the applications received and select six teams in each division in December. We will announce before the end of the year so that you can be hitting the ground running in the spring semester. Following the selection of those 12 participating teams, teams are required to submit a variety of deliverables. Throughout this process, we will have stage gates where we're able to approve you to proceed to the next stage. Our goal here is that all 12 teams reach the end and we have 12 competing teams on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. in July of 2020. But we recognize that sometimes teams have struggled to meet all of the requirements that are necessary. And so we have these points where we're able to check your progress and make sure that you're making forward progress on a reasonable schedule. So in April of 
2019, we'll want to see that you're through your design development phase. In November, we'll want to review your construction documentation and make sure that you're ready to really go out and start building your project. And in uh, summer of 2020, that you've completed your construction and you're ready for a safe and effective participation in the challenge. Ultimately, we would like all teams to advance. This isn't another down selection process. It's just a check or a stage gate process so that we can provide that approval to proceed. We will have prizes provided to all participating teams. As Linda's mentioned on other webinars, we do expect that to be about $100,000 for each of the national showcase teams and about $5,000 for each of the local build teams tied to the expected or additional cost of transportation and assembly through the different divisions. Ultimately, you'll go to the team application site, you'll choose your challenge, you'll indicate your division, and then you'll submit your build challenge proposal. In terms of our application site, you'll go to solodecathlon.gov and the apply page. From the apply page, you can click a link which will send you to Reg Online. On Reg Online, you'd start your registration, you'd indicate your build challenge, and you'd indicate the email address of your primary contact for your team. This could be a faculty advisor or this could be a team lead. For this main team contact, we would like a phone number so we can follow up if anything's missing, and then we'd like to understand what your role is on the competition. You can add a second contact as well if it's a separate uh, faculty lead or a separate student team leader as well. From there, you choose which division you're going to participate in, either the local build or the national showcase division. You'll indicate the academic level of your team, whether or not you're going to partner with multiple collegiate institutions. You can have multiple schools participate together, and then how that uh, institution should be contacted and referenced. We will want you to have an initial team roster and that you will submit your build challenge proposal. You indicate your understanding that we do raise sponsorship for the program and that we do have some concerns or policies regarding non-citizens accessing the NREL site as part of the Design Challenge Weekend in April of 2019. From there, just let us know how you heard about us, pay the $100 application fee, and you're done. Associated with that application, we do want you to make sure that you also recognize that you have to complete a build challenge proposal. This proposal helps us to down select to the 12 competing teams. And so in this proposal, it's a 30 page document where we'll look for a cover page, we'll look for a table of contents, introduction, talk about the technical team approach, your fundraising and budgeting, organization and project planning, conceptual design, community and support and collegiate institution support, any, any other considerations. We want to understand whether or not you've worked with your university leadership, whether or not you've considered a project budget successfully, whether or not you have some design ideas. Do note that we are not going to hold you to your conceptual design or any of your individual partners. This is really for us to help choose the 12 teams that have the highest likelihood of success as participants in the Solar Decathlon. We'll evaluate the proposal according to the criteria outlined in that proposal document, um, but we'll look at your technical team approach for 25% of the score, your fundraising approach and your plan for budgeting. Do you have a reasonable idea of what participation in the build challenge entails as 25% of your score? We'll consider your overall organizational and project planning structure. We have less weight on your conceptual design because again, we want to know that you're taking a good approach. We're not evaluating whether or not one conceptual design is necessarily better than the other, but we're saying, have they thought about it? Have you taken a good approach? And then we'll look at your overall college's support. So is the university leadership engaged? Are you going to offer some coursework integration or curriculum integration? Are you gonna offer some teaching assistance or some summer internships for your participating team leaders or other participants, and then other unique areas for your team's participation. We will look for a team roster, and then we'll invite you to join our groups.io project site as soon as you've completed that application. On this site is where we'll share, share new information, new resources, information about upcoming webinars, information about additional information that you need to collect. 
We'll also provide several educational resources. We'll provide some building science training for teams to participate in. We'll provide free access to REMRATE for creating uh, evaluations of your team house is expected performance. And we'll also provide some evaluated and available expertise from industry sponsors and financial analysis tools. So we do encourage you to complete your application so that you can get access to that groups.io site where we'll have this additional information. I talked about this on the timeline slide, but do note that we want to keep your team moving forward throughout this process. So we'll start with the project management plan. We'll go through design development submission, which should represent about 50% complete design. So you've thought about your mechanical systems, you've thought about your structural systems, you have a functioning floor plan, you have a site plan, you've done some of this efforts. Uh, you'll then do a design presentation in April. We'll do a design challenge weekend where teams will come to the design challenge weekend at NREL. Uh, and then you'll sort of go back and work from the rest of your semester into the fall to complete your construction documentation, which at this point should be nearly ready to go. We'll then uh, ask you to build your house. You'll complete a project summary, which will include some rendering, some photography, public summaries that we can put on the website of your team design. And then ultimately in May, we'll get your jury deliverables, your houses will be complete, and then we'll open up to the public. Ultimately, uh, we do ask teams to participate in building science training. We do think that's a key to overall success, that you understand building science, that you understand energy performance. So we'll have some free training available, but you can also work with your faculty to have a waiver if you have already taken the equivalent coursework. So there are opportunities, but we do think building science is key to success as part of the Solar Decathlon. We do provide some guidance for naming your files, making sure that you follow uh, the name of your division, that you provide the name of your university and that you submit your proposal to the Build Challenge Dropbox before November 6th. Overall, we're really excited for this upcoming edition of the Solar Decathlon. We think it's a great combination of ways to increase the total number of students participating, increase the ways for those students to engage with each other, increase the opportunity for working with industry partners, increase the direction of your funds and your resources towards the actual building, actual construction, actual innovations, and ways to push the industry forward, as well as increase the overall national, international impact by partnering with industry events like the Folklife Festival and International Builders Show to make sure that we have hundreds of thousands of people learning about your designs, learning about your innovations through the Solar Decathlon, both in the Design Challenge as well in the Build Challenge. So we really hope that you'll join us we really hope that you'll go through the application process, and we look forward to seeing all of your ideas. We're really excited because the Build Challenge returns to the National Mall. It provides a new local build opportunity, provides a greater access to the home building industry. It's a lower cost of commitment to your universities. We have a focused increase on STEM education, and we have reduced logistical burdens for participation in the event overall. So your next steps are to form a team, complete a team application, including your Build the Challenge proposal document, and then start work. You're able to start work whenever you'd like, get as far ahead as you'd like. We're looking forward to seeing what you come up with and looking forward to seeing you meet all of those deliverables. From there, we're happy to conclude, open it up for any questions that you may have, encourage you to participate in social media with the hashtag SolidCathlon and to join our next webinar. From here, I'd like to open it up for just a couple minutes of questions before we conclude for today. So Joe, I have a first question yeah. for you. If selected, do the Build Challenge teams have to participate in the Design Challenge event? That's a great question. And so, yes, we do expect those teams to participate in the design challenge weekend. And so you'll still be working towards your final design and your construction drawings, but by sending up to five students and up to two faculty to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, you'll be able to present to our industry viewers who will provide the approval to proceed, but we'll also have some round robin discussions with professionals from our communications team, from our building code and inspections team, from our measurement and instrumentation team to make sure that as you proceed into the construction phase, 
you're prepared for success, and you have the greatest possible opportunities. So you should plan on sending up to seven people to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in April of 2019. And are the teams responsible for those travel costs? They are. And so the organizers will provide the food and the space for the entire weekend, but the travel costs for those students are the, and the faculty are the responsibility of the team. So we found different ways in which the schools take that approach. It can be that if you're in a university that is driving distance to Golden, Colorado, you maybe take a university van and take the 10 hour drive together at a low cost and stay at an Airbnb to really minimize your costs. Other universities may fly or take other resources as well. We do provide a hotel room block at a discounted rate for those participating students. And we do again provide uh, food and opportunities for local transportation in the own town while we're here. My next question is for Linda. Linda, I want to make sure you're off mute. Okay. Can teams participate in both the build challenge and the design challenge? Yes. So, um, team, well, a university could have a team in multiple um, divisions of the design challenge, but an only one division of the build challenge. So you will have to commit to either being in the local build or the national showcase on the build challenge side. But um, just, just a clarification that came up yesterday, um, you can't start off in the design challenge and then move to the build challenge. You have to make a commitment in, um, in your November application. Thanks, Linda. And also to expand on that, the opportunity then exists if you have multiple design studios at the university or multiple sets of teams where one team could be working towards the local or national showcase build solution. Again, as Linda mentioned, only one team per division in the build challenge because we think it's just too much effort and not enough diversity of solutions for one university to be building two houses. Uh, but across the design division, if you have one set of four to seven students working on an elementary school design and a different set of students working on a single family design, that's perfectly fine. So we'd love to see those multiple applications. So this question is for Joe. Can schools partner with other schools to participate? It's a great question. We encourage that type of participation. So we've had successful examples, as you saw before, from Parsons, the New School of Design, and Stevens Institute of Technology. We've seen Arizona State and the University of New Mexico partner together. Team Capital DC, I think, was four universities working together, as well as Team Kentuckiana. Uh, Kentucky, Indiana was four universities working together in the past. I will caution those teams who are considering multiple universities, or even if you have multiple departments within your university, to think from the very beginning about high quality team communications. How do you know who's doing what? How do you know who's responsible for what? And so team partnering across universities or across departments can be hugely successful, but do think about who's responsible and how you're ensuring that you have good quality communications at the end of that project. Okay, we have just a couple more minutes. Um, and we do have a handful of more questions, so I would say we will respond if we don't get to yeah. questions today. So there is some questions about how the former contests like Water Challenge include in this year's competition grading. Sure, that's a great question. And so the Water Competition was a standalone juried contest in Solid Cathlon in 2017. And what we've done is we've really taken that and integrated it throughout the other contests in both a juried contest way, so what is our engineering jury considering, what's our market potential and architecture jury considering, adding those thoughts beyond water efficiency, uh, innovation in landscaping, all those different areas, while also taking some of the feedback from our jurors from Solid Cap on 2017 and integrating it into a more modern consideration of water efficiency in the measured contest. And so you'll see in, for example, the hot water subcontest in the operations contest, instead of measuring can teams get to 110 degrees in 15 minutes or less and 
encouraging teams to use more volume over more time, we're actually going to measure the efficiency of the water system and think about how long it takes for hot water to reach that shower head. And so things like that have been shifted and moved around, but it conceptually and overall, the structure is very similar. And so where we saw additional opportunities in resilience, we moved opportunities from water to those different areas. And because of the local build and the national showcase divisions, we provided some new opportunities for evaluating the performance, but we've moved it around. So it's generally the same, but as you read those documents, you'll see those details referenced elsewhere. So we're out of time, but I'm gonna close you with, let's restate when the applications are due and the down select. Sure, applications are due on November 6th of 2018. And so that includes your complete application, including your $100 application fee, your initial team roster, and your build challenge proposal document. So that's due on November 6th, and we expect to let teams know whether or not they've been selected in December of 2018. So our goal is by the end of the year, you should absolutely know, am I a competing team in the Solar Decathlon build challenge, or am I not? A reminder that all teams who apply to the design challenge are accepted at this stage and that uh, any team who is not accepted into the build challenge will be provided an opportunity to continue their participation as part of the design challenge. In 2018, I believe we had over 80 teams participating in the design challenge, of which we were able to invite for 2019, we're going to be able to invite 48 competing teams as part of the design challenge. Ultimately, we're really excited to have 60 teams represented as part of this edition of Solar Decathlon through the April Design Challenge event. November 6th, that's the date to remember. Bye-bye. Overall, thank you so much for your participation. We're really excited to have you here. I hope you have a great day and talk to you soon.